Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Welcome to the part two of Professor Alex Logan's webinar. My name is Graham Rong. I'm a director of corporations at MIT. Today, I'm your host of this session. MIT Corporation serves as the chief gateway for industry to access to MIT and my MIT connected startups. We help IOP members uh, navigate in the fast resource, resources at MIT and find the best opportunities to learn and to collaborate. We all hope we will recover soon from the COVID pandemic that has impacted the entire world. Increased energy demand will accompany that recovery process. If this recovery is met by hydrocarbons, global warming will accelerate. Development of renewable energy systems can meet energy and employment needs. And so to have a truly sustainable future, what must we do? Turn black into green. Now, how do we do it? Set a high bar. That's the theme of today's webinar. Professor Alex Logan covered the theme from the philosophical and the strategic viewpoints at the first part of the webinar. He will cover more on the technology discussion today. He will speak for 55 minutes including Q&A. So please ask questions and also vote on them. For those participating for the first time, in addition to the session today, the webinar series details can be found on our website, ilp.mit.edu, under the watch and then webinar tab. All the sessions are recorded and recording will be available on the same website. For those currently with your computer, at the bottom of your screen, you can see several icons. Please use Q&A icon to ask questions and to vote on them. Chat icon is reserved for technical questions with the organization, organizers. Now let me introduce our speaker, Professor Alex Logan. Alex is the Water and Hazard May Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT and a member of American National Academy of Engineering. He has over 130 patents and has helped develop 12 products that have received R&D 100 awards for one of the 100 best technical products of the year. He has helped start several successful precision manufacturing equipment companies and has a passion for working with industry to solve real problems and identify fundamental research topics. Over the past three decades, Alex has traveled millions of miles all over the world to help people of all ages and backgrounds and from all types of industries learn how to creatively identify and solve problems. For the past decades, his prime focus has been on renewable energy systems. Alex also loves sports from scuba to snowboarding to marathons and has completed 21 iron distance tri triathlons. Today, Alex is wearing a special Aloha shirt that he also wore when meeting with uh, President Obama. With that, let's welcome Professor Slogan. Thank you, Graham. Uh, it was very nice to see you again and have that wonderful intro. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Professor Alex Slocum, or just call me Alex. Uh, growing up on the beach in LA, I'm very informal. And today we are going to focus on part two, where I do a deep technical dive into some of the methods and processes and, and individual machines that we can use to not only, I believe, uh, stop and maybe even start reversing global warming a little bit, but also 
uh, means to really emerge from the COVID economic crisis because like often happens after many giant calamities, there's a need to rebuild. And that forms a basis for a whole new wonderful breadth of opportunities for employment, innovation, companies to start and grow. So it's a time of intense stress for many. But I think we should also look at it as a team, it's a time for intense opportunity for the human race to come back together, fix climate change and move forward. So I want to now uh, switch to my uh, PowerPoint sharing the screen with you all and dive deeply into some of the technologies that I think are there and ready to deploy. In addition, there will be new ones coming down the pike also, of course. So let's pick up where we left off starting where we have a greenhouse emissions fee and we've got places such as coal mines. H how do we in bring new technology and what sort of technology would be brought in? So the first thing is coal is a highly complex and variable molecule depending on where you mine it. Much like oil, there's different grades of oil around the world. Our first job is to say, we're not gonna shut down coal mines and fire coal workers and let them figure it out. Our first job is to say coal is far too valuable a molecule to be burning. The United States, the rest of the world really wants a future for the next thousand years. We are gonna need complex molecules. And if we burn it all up, we won't have it for the far future. So in the short term, Let's take the coal mines and let's convert them to places, for example, for solar panels and wind turbines where appropriate, employ the miners in those construction jobs and then those maintenance jobs. Meanwhile, at those same areas, start a focus on identifying ideas in the mines to create and build out those ideas for how to take the complex molecule of coal and turn it into products that we need as a chemical feedstock. Paints, plastics, all sorts of modern wonders need chemical feedstocks, which now often ends up being things like natural gas or oil. And those are gonna be limited, so we might as well use the coal we have. In addition, the coal ash at power plants is loaded with rare earths and minerals that we dig up other places to get. So we want to be able to process that coal ash, and that means figure out ways to economically do it into a resource. So remember that we don't want to dump on coal miners and say they are the problem. The result of their work was to help us get where we are in many good ways, and now there's an opportunity to move forward. So we're not going to victimize or villainize anybody. We're gonna recognize everybody has contributed to where we are now, the good and the difficult. Now we're all gonna work forward. And here is how we do it with coal. And of course, I've got to use one of my little references to poems here from Optimism. Ray Stevens, Everything is Beautiful song. Good thing to listen to. And uh, music is gonna be one of the ways we can spread this. So remember, we're gonna call upon artists to create the means to communicate the broad philosophical ideas, but now these technical ideas. So these are the detailed technical ideas I want to cover here. There's many more, but here's where we're gonna uh, start. And the first one is ocean mining to provide minerals for renewables based world. We are gonna need so many minerals that are now rare and only found in a few select locations, which might lead to a grab and hence war. But the one place they exist everywhere is diffused in the ocean and on the bottom of the ocean. And I'll go through in detail because I know some people are saying, great, and other people are saying, ah, you're gonna wreck the ocean now. Uh, so we're, we're gonna keep, keep all those views in mind. The next area is renewable energy uh, technology advances, and uh, I'll give examples from storage, from new machines to make the new energy machines, and uh, 
cover some of the rate breadth of technologies out there. There are many, and that is a many, many such webinars in themselves, but I can I can hopefully show here are some key things and the basic numbers for them to demonstrate technology that can work, does work, and we need to build out. The next topic is on the big system level, Desert Tech. That was a program that was started long ago, envisioned to have North Africa be a renewable energy resource and source for Europe. It's gone up and down with uh, different issues in the world. There looks to be a resurgence of it starting and I'll go through some of that. And that's gonna be one of the keys to global climate change stopping what's happening in desert tech can then be a pattern for the rest of the world. Like for example, uh, in North America and Central America, the region in the uh, American Southwest and in many parts of Mexico and in Latin America can be similar to desert tech. Fantastic sunshine, that then becomes the source of energy that can be sent long distances to where it's needed. Along those lines, is indigenized energy. And that is the concept where around the world, there are many uh, groups of indigenous people who have large land reserves that often they have to keep fighting to keep control of them because people see them as either resources or places to just go across. And indigenous people have in general better long term in the past and vision forward for how they want to preserve their regions. And some examples of those places often could become also fantastic renewable energy sources and hence also a really good source of income for those people to help maintain their culture and for the rest of the world to realize, wow, that's really great. And the last area I want to touch on is what I call trash to treasure. And throughout history, there have been, quote, garbage pickers. When I go running, I run long distances. I pick up aluminum cans along the side of the road, take them home. It's a form of urban mining. And over the course of a year, I typically collect enough cans that I can turn them in and afford a new pair of running shoes. It's kind of a nice way of cleanup and recycle. But it goes beyond that because we have a lot of invasive plants. We have bigger and worse storms and we need new technology to clean up from the invasive plants that are happening because of climate change. And we need a way to clean up from the storm debris. And if we just sweep them up and dump them in landfills, we'll exacerbate global warming. But if we can clean them up and actually use them as a biofuel to offset the need for uh, hydrocarbons that we mine, then that will also help us uh, prevent spewing forth more carbon that previously nature locked away. So we can all get together and feel all right. That's the, uh, the, the word from Bob Marley that you know, I'm going to invoke. So now let's focus on ocean mining. We're going to need a lot of minerals to do all the renewables, for example, solar panels require a lot of special minerals to make. If we want to make uh, some of the giant wind turbines that are being called for so-called direct drive machines, they're gonna need a lot of rare earth minerals to make the magnets for them. Meanwhile, in parallel around the world, people are recognizing that offshore wind turbines can be made much bigger and hence more efficient which offsets the cost of going offshore. But we can further offset that cost if we use the wind turbine itself for not only being a wind turbine, but also as a means for holding another machine that works below the surface of the water to absorb minerals from the ocean directly. So you get a two for one from the support structure. The next ocean mining topic we're going to touch on is deep ocean mining. So the first one is like near the surface. The next one is deep ocean mining of nodules. Now, there's a lot of proposals and talk about this. It's been looked at over the last probably 50 years or more. 
And the challenge is that these modules on the bottom of the C, or excuse me, nodules, mm -hmm. typically, for example, a fist size on the order of, litter the bottom, but they sitting in very soft mush. If you've ever tried to cross a, a swamp and know the way you, your foot sinks in, you'll understand the swamp muck. And it's even more uh, soft, mushy, mucky on the bottom. And these nodules can be many kilometers deep, three, four, five kilometers deep under the ocean. And you got to get them to the surface and they're heavy. And so there's a lot of energy expended to get them up and various methods of gathering them even. The big concern is you're going to stir up so much silt and when you get them up to the surface, they're often one view is just pump them up. So now you got to get rid of the silt you just pumped up. Some people think, ah, just let it go, it'll sink. But the disruption to the mid-ocean layers and indeed disrupting what's on the bottom, which we don't even really know what exists yet, this is one of those cases where we have to be really careful and we can debate it back and forth. Or we can say, maybe the opposite is we can figure out a way to get just the nodules and not disturb anything too much. So we'll talk about some of those technologies. And notice my little quote there by Abraham Lincoln. So this is 150 years ago that Abe basically was saying, wow, the wind is really powerful and we got to figure out how to tap it. This is true for all these other topics. Okay, from seawater. So this was a, a actually comes from a project um, that I did was part of a big Department of Energy goal, which has been around for many decades to extract uranium from seawater to do power uh, nuclear power plants. Because if the world really does build out nuclear power, this was 20 years ago, the thinking, there's only enough uranium on the surface for 100 years. Turns out in the ocean, there's enough uranium to last hundreds of thousands of years. It's dissolved in the seawater. And so there's a big effort to find the polymers and things to adsorb. That means grab it on the surface of the device. Uranium. Our research goal was to figure out how to make it economical. I had a graduate student then, Maha Haji, and her doctoral thesis was, how can we design a system to do that? And what it ended up with is if you have a wind turbine tower offshore in the deep water, as you can see here on the right, we then run up and down string of cable with little, these little, these would be about half a meter to a meter in diameter like wiffle balls. They have holes in them. These plastic spheres can be made from recycled plastics because we don't care if they're full of holes. We want them full of holes. And inside this plastic sphere is the specially created, basically uh, treated uh, polyethylene plastic that uranium sticks to. And it turns out that if you do a five megawatt wind turbine offshore, Every year, you can collect the equivalent amount of uranium needed to power five megawatts worth of nuclear power continually. So every essentially, every time you put in a wind turbine uh, offshore in at least uh, 100 meters of water, that you not only get five megawatts of power from the wind turbine, you get five megawatts worth of power from the uranium you can collect. Now, in doing this research project, one of the things we found was other materials often are adsorbed before the uranium. That's problematic. But remember our general theme, one over problem equals solution, one over sadness equals happiness. And it turns out that vanadium is absorbed in great quantities also. Well, we need vanadium for vanadium redox batteries for energy storage. So there again, you, you get much more than you just thought you would get. Now, one of the things you need for batteries is cobalt. And there's a huge quest for cobalt-free batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe it'll happen. But we also still need cobalt for special high-strength steels. And cobalt is uh, available only in limited places in the world. And I thought, well, maybe we can get cobalt from the ocean, too. No cobalt. And then I remembered, because we raised sheep for many years, and we always had to give our sheep a mineral supplement. And one of the reasons that sheep 
stopped being raised in the northeast of the United States was the soils are thin and they were very rapidly depleted of the cobalt. And cobalt is something that green plants uptake. And there's enough for the green plants to uptake, but not in the amount that the sheep need when they eat the grass. So you have to give them a supplement. Whereas out west, there's a lot more. That's one of the reasons why sheep farming declined here. But I, in my back of my mind, I remembered, wow, we have to give these mineral supplements that include cobalt for our sheep. Huh, it's cobalt, green. And you'll see in a minute, I'm also working on a project with sargassum seaweed uh, inundation. So that I wonder maybe there's no cobalt in the ocean because it's all eaten up by the green plants. What if we go deep? And indeed, doing literature search, we found that below 100 meters, where it's dark, there's a lot of cobalt. So this same idea of adsorbing uranium and vanadium, we can also get cobalt. And there's many other minerals too. So this is the chemists to specially treat the plastic. This is a good use for recycled plastics as, as these mineral adsorbers in the ocean. And as Jacques Cousteau said, we have to look at the sea often as a farmer. So here's a picture of the image of the wiffle ball with the little purple spiky thing in the inside representing the polymer. Now, for those of you who may or may not believe that offshore wind is gonna come fast enough or in large enough places to do the mineral adsorption, we can also start right now just with offshore platforms that already exist for hydrocarbons in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. It's particularly good because these are warm waters. And here we have a map of offshore platforms that are in deep enough water. And we call this the new offshore opportunity for underwater cobalt harvesting work. No ouch, because you don't have to go and dig up uh, the Congo, for example to get the cobalt you need. Just off of these offshore platforms that exist now, these cobalt harvesters could be put in and this could develop, uh, the, or provide the cobalt for many hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles a year in the United States to be built, all the batteries they need and more. And all around the world, there are offshore platforms and warm waters. So we don't have to go away to get what we need. We can just uh, take, take me home country roads, like John Denver says, and uh, we can get it all here. And when I say get it all here, I mean everybody everywhere can get it all where they are. For example, let's uh, look over to China. Our friends in China are doing a really good job of wanting to make electric vehicles. They really want to try to drive the country to all electric vehicles as soon as possible. The battery is getting a lot of cobalt. And I think you can see this is one of the rationale for expanding trade to find the mineral resources they need to achieve this all electric goal. And expanding trade is a good thing. It's even better if you can get it right where you are. And again, we're gonna do the symbiotic approach that, this, that the China Sea has fantastic potential for offshore wind. And indeed, uh, Shanghai itself would be a most excellent uh, place with its port facilities and industrial base to be building and then sending right offshore there on the China Sea offshore wind turbines. And you see there's a very large shelf there where it still can be deep enough to harvest uh, the minerals. And let's just look at it. The area of that continental shelf area we see in the China Sea, about a million square kilometers. And let's say you take 5% of it ultimately to be farmed. Offshore wind, the base of the offshore wind uh, towers can also hold uh, fish farming nets. It's a gentleman, Bella Buck in Germany, who has done a fantastic job of looking at fish farming with offshore wind in the North Sea, for example. So then you can get your electric power, you can get your protein, and below the level of the fish farm, because that's where you want to go to get the cobalt, for example, 
are these structures that run on wires as we showed earlier. And let's assume now that you have, you know, one structure per square kilometer. So you have 50,000, almost 51,000 wind turbines. The offshore ones are bigger. So the peak power will be seven megawatts. They're actually soon to be going perhaps to 10, but we'll stick with our seven. That's the peak power, which means that you don't get it all the time, but the 24 seven is the peak power times the capacity factor. 40% is rather modest for offshore wind. So that means that those 51,000 wind turbines could provide a potential 24 seven power of 143 gigawatts. So that's like 70 really large coal plants. If we assume that uh, you also have power from the uranium you're absorbing, that's another 143 gigawatts. If we now assume each person needs an average, 24 seven average of 1500 watts per person. In the United States, it's about 2000 watts per person. <clears throat> and that includes all the equivalent needs for in, uh, industry and everything. It's not the average power per person you're gonna need if you're also gonna power your automobiles. Um, you'd have to about double that if you wanna get all the power but based on that 1500 watts per person, the South China Sea could easily support all the electric power needs of about 200 million people. So about one sixth of China's population. If you want to also power all their cars and everything upcoming, it's probably only about 100 million people or 10% ish of China's population could be served by South China Sea. And there's a lot more coastline and regions in China. So it doesn't have to do it all, but it can do a lot. And you would harvest enough uh, cobalt per year to build 20 million electric vehicles. So you see, by, by combining these technologies, offshore wind, which exists, with the technology that we recently developed, the adsorption, in the very, you can start right now building this out and it can be done in south china sea as we showed earlier you, we can do it in the gulf of mexico it can be done off the coast of nigeria all around uh the world where you have warmer waters and offshore oil platforms so that's uh mining the oceans near the surface I look a little deeper now on the left you see a, a, a an approach that was called 19th century approach. I think that should probably be 20th century approach, the 1900s. But I took this slide from this uh, YouTube video where a company, so what's on the left was, is what's being envisioned by many of these giant, giant. So these would be machines weighing maybe up to several hundred tons that would go along the seafloor, vacuuming up with big conveyors all the nodules, but they would also be picking up a lot of mud, sea life, everybody. And they would go back and forth across the ocean floor, harvesting nodules. Of course, everything in their path would, that they harvest will be killed. And then the idea is to pump it up a riser to the surface. At the surface, you separate the nodules and then let the muck back to sink. This company wanted to envision uh, these devices that would glide just above the bottom and then with advanced vision, you know, robotic systems pluck just nodules. And you'd leave the nodule that has somebody growing on it. It's a very nice idea. So using swarm robotics, and then when the machine is filled up with nodules, it then rises to the surface. So I like my, uh, uh, Years I did martial arts for many years, and I still stretch and you know, do some of my katas in the mornings. And uh, Bruce Lee was obviously I was a big Bruce Lee movie fan. It was very sad he he died so young. But he had some really he was a very good philosopher too. And I like this quote, which I think uh, reflects this wonderfully: "To hell with circumstances! I create opportunities." So again, on the left you have here is the uh, normal big way of thinking about it, but it'll really wreck a lot of things. And then on the right, you have uh, 
recognizing the wreckage of new technology. And I think uh, we're seeing now that the deep underwater vehicles, many of them pioneered by the oil industry, by the way, for servicing the deep parts of uh, offshore oil rigs could now be brought to bear to develop undersea mining. Now there's a little detail still about how do you get the stuff to the surface. So the current mod nodule mining methods, we said you got this riser that goes up and then you push down the uh, effluent. But in the process, you, you were just going to create these giant clouds of, of, of mush. They're going to kill everything. The robotic company proposed when they get full, lift them to the surface with lift bags. Now, there's one little detail. At the bottom of the ocean, five kilometers down, you have about 500 atmospheres of pressure. So how do you inflate a lift bag and get stuff to the surface? So that's a little detail that wasn't really well thought out because 500 atmospheres, that's about 6,000 pounds per square inch or about 50 megapascals of pressure. And you can't fill up a gas tank at the surface much more than that. So when you bring that uh, gas tank, you know, tank full of pressurized gas down to the bottom and open the valve, nothing will happen because the water will just keep it pushed in there. So technology we've been developing and thinking about is how do we generate the gas down below? And it's this way. It turns out that for decades, many people have been looking at can you treat aluminum such that when you mix it with water, it forms hydrogen? And there's many different approaches uh, to do that. So what we envision is uh, the fact that when you do mix this aluminum fuel with water to make hydrogen, it will do so and you can't retard the process by pressure. So if you're on the bottom of the ocean and you mix this special fuel with water, it will make hydrogen gas, period. And it'll keep making it. So you just design the container such that when it makes the hydrogen, it builds it to the pressure when the fuel is all used up, that that pressure in the container is enough, one, that you can use it to power your robotic arms, so you don't need batteries down there. And two, you fill up high pressure containers by displacing water that's in them. So initially your robot up at the surface, you have water in those containers. And at the bottom, you use the water itself to mix with the fuel to make hydrogen, which then pushes out the excess water. You now have an empty container, although it has 500 atmosphere hydrogen in it. And when you pushed out all the water, at the same time you've picked up all the nodules and then you let go and bloop, it'll float to the surface. Now on the surface, the, ro the crane picks it up with all the nodules, but now all those containers filled with your 5,000 PSI hydrogen, which is now a fuel source for on that ship for fuel cells to now electrically power the ship to take you back to the shore. And the whole, the numbers work out where it's a nice balance. The amount of fuel you need to raise up all the nodules, take the ship to shore, and then come back out again for round two, uh, the same amount of hydrogen. So it actually balances out very nicely. So this is at the, you know, early research stage. Uh, the early physics is proved out. So this is one of those things where, okay, in the next three to five years, yes, we could do this. So this would be the alternative to the conventional thinking of giant five meter long, excuse me, five multi kilometer long cables connecting the giant robot machine on the bottom of the surface. <clears throat> the next topic we're going to move from the sea to the shore of energy storage. So remember, energy storage is really critical. And because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and chemical batteries are going to be an important part of energy storage. There's going to be a lot of making of ice for using as a as cooling for air conditioners when you need it. 
So you make ice when you have excess power. There's going to be a lot of use of deep freezes where we store our food, our frozen vegetables, driving the temperature from minus 40 down to minus 80, for example. And in that lower range of temperatures, you don't change the food quality at all, but it allows you to drive it really cold. And then uh, when other people need the power, just let the temperature rise to minus 40, you won't affect the food. A lot, of, a lot of battery storage, things like that. But we're going to need, in the end, really big amounts of storage. And an interesting thing is a lot of people live near the coast. Like I said, I, I grew up in LA. I love the beach. Um, that was the first uh, half of my younger years and the second half, you know, uh, middle school and high school in the Washington area. Big difference. Um, people like living near the coast where it's warm and sunny and the beaches and everything else. And often there are mountains nearby. So that's what you see around the Southern California region, for example, and many places in the world. And uh, one of the best ways to store energy is to pump water uphill and then let it run down. hundred year old technology and in the 1950s, when everyone thought nuclear power would be too cheap to meter, you still don't want to turn your a nuclear power system off. You want to keep it running 24-7. And this will be true if we get fusion power or new designs for nuclear reactors, the so-called small modular reactors that you fuel once and forget. You, you don't want to cycle them. You want to keep them running. So in the night, when not so much power is needed, you'll pump the water uphill. And if it's near the ocean, we can pump seawater up and store it up high in a reservoir. And the reservoir will be lined. So like any other sort of, um, like when they, when they have trash, for example, at a landfill, you line it and you have sensors. So there's no danger of, uh oh, we're, we have a leak and you're going to wreck your groundwater because these energy storage reservoirs for pumped hydro are not going to be giant Lake Meads. They're going to be just big enough to hold the water needed. So if you did start to detect a leak, you could just dump it until you fix the leak. And these things would cycle maybe one or two times a day. And it's very interesting that if you think about what a person needs, this is intelligent design somehow when the universe was created that the, the, the head or the distance that the storage reservoir has to be above the ocean to have the most efficient uh, pumped hydro machines, the pumps and the turbines to generate power when you need it, is 500 to 700 meters, which is the same head or pressure that you need for running reverse osmosis. So there's a reference there for a paper we published. It's all open access. You can read about it. And how much energy you want to store? Well, when you got wind and solar running, we're going to assume that they're going to give you enough energy total, but for 24-7 operation of a person. But you need to store about half of that. And the amount of energy you're going to need to store then is equivalent to 20 cubic meters of water up at that 600 meters of height. And then when you want the electric power, the water will run back down through the turbines, generate power. Now, the fresh water you need is about 500 liters of water per person per day. So that includes your industrial need too. That's not just 500 liters of fresh water you need, for example, per person if you have teenagers at home. Um, one of the problems with reverse osmosis is you take the salt out of the water and what's left is water with a lot of salt. And then that's expensive and dangerous if you're not careful to put it back in the ocean because it can locally kill everything where you release it. But if we put these systems next to each other, then the 20 cubic meters of water a day that are rushing out to the ocean to generate power having been stored up high can mix with the 500 liters of brine that is created by RO and dilute it now on the order of 40 to 1. And then now you can just let loose in the ocean. Furthermore, notice that this flow of water in and out would be just perfect for offshore shellfish farms, for example, to help keep them healthy. There's another symbiotic use we can get. So this all can work. It'll cost somewhere around, uh, we estimate if you actually do this in large scale, about $5 per installed watt for the energy storage system, the solar and wind, for, for everything all together. And the levelized cost of electricity would then be somewhere five to eight cents a kilowatt hour. I here in New England where I am, 
these systems wouldn't be feasible here, pay 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Southern California, some of it depends upon what time of day, but again, it's uh, more expensive than this. So we're, we're certainly in the ballpark. Now you may say, well, if I, if I burn coal, it's not a problem because it'll be a few pennies a kilowatt hour. Yeah, and we, we in California won't burn coal. We'll let them burn it over in Utah so we can be clean. Uh, that doesn't work. You have to think, remember, the world is round. So uh, particularly when burning hydrocarbons for electric power soon really needs to be 50 cents a kilowatt hour because of the greenhouse emissions fee. It's coming. So uh, how else can we, where else can we do this? Well, let's look at where we could do this from Chile to Southern California, for example. We, we believe we can do this. And uh, again, our Belt and Road friends in China could help. They're uh, working real hard in, in South America to try to build hydroelectric systems and to work with, to get minerals there. And uh, I, I'm not worried about it's them or us or somebody else. I, I, this quote from the Australian Aboriginals, uh, we're all visitors to this time and place. We're just passing through. Let's just leave it nice, grow, work together, be nice so when we go home, we can be happy. Okay, so for example, let's start in California. And uh, you see here uh, Malibu, and when I first did this, uh, and Malibu is a wonderful place to ride your bike up and down the hills, there's a lot of state forests. So we're not talking about right at the beach where all uh, people love to go and some people have these giant rich houses. Um, there will be some points where we will need to get the machines, you know, the pipelines for the seawater to go in and out, but they can become parks and have nice things planted on top. What we've done there in those uh, rectangles is putting areas in we're showing where be great locations for these uh, reservoirs. And we list the head, we list the surface area, distance from the coast. You're looking for things less than 10 kilometers from the coast. And if you look at this energy potential in gigawatt hours per cycle, we only need a few of these developed in order to serve the need, pop, needs of the entire population of that whole region. Now, I understand that some people would go, oh, you can't do this in Malibu. Well, you'd never see it, actually. Oh, but, you know, I don't, I don't want anything anyway. You know, the NIMBY, uh, even worse than NIMBY, the, the people who don't want anything anyway. Okay, fine. So you go a little further south. So this is between L.A. and San Diego. And I'm apolitical. I really am. I just want to work with whoever wants to work to save the planet and create good jobs and investment, et cetera, et cetera. We can, all of us can have it all, by the way. San Clemente um, is a region where the government owns vast tracts of land. And uh, one of our former presidents, President Nixon, used to love going out there. He had some challenges and issues. Uh, wouldn't that be interesting if now redemption comes from the form of that region can be cited for or used to cite these, I call them IFROS, Integrated Pumped Hydro Reverse Osmosis Systems. On government land, put an IFROS machine there to enable all of Southern California to go renewable. You have energy storage for it all. And if we look at these two sites in San Clemente, the one that's uh, 13 kilometers from the coast, that's a little far, but eh, not that far. Certainly acceptable. That coupled with the closer one I'd build first, which is only four kilometers from the coast, where we have a uh, potential to store 17 gigawatt hours of energy. That's what I would do right there on government land. I'd start digging tomorrow. Well, of course you have to do the proper civil engineering, et cetera, et cetera. When some people worry about the environmental consequences, well, that's okay because the fire came through and burned up everything anyway. And if it didn't burn it up this time, global warming is going to create the fires to burn up the rest of it. So, with that, let's look. Uh, let's look south. In Mexico, and when I was a young lad, uh, I recall uh, there were Boy Scout trips. My brother was a Boy Scout. We would take into Mexico to help, uh, you know, do projects for for locals in Mexico who needed 
you know, poor villages and things needed help. And then later on, we always used to like going to Tijuana. It was just a fun place back then. This is in the 60s. Um, and I was just a kid, but and with, you know, going with the family, it was still culturally a fantastic experience. So in uh, Ensenada and in Tijuana, there is fantastic potential for IFROS machines, really fantastic. Look at the amount of energy you can store per cycle. And they're close to the coast. I contend that uh, if somebody wants to work with the government of Mexico to put in these IFROS machines, there's enough electricity, renewable energy could be generated from putting in the wind turbines in those beautiful high mountains with great wind and then solar power from the deserts in Mexico that so much renewable energy and fresh water could be harvested and it would be very easily able to supply what Mexico needs and then sell a bunch of it up north into California if the Californians don't want to have a broader long-term reality thinking for what's needed for renewables. I'm picking, I can do that because remember I grew up down there so I can pick on my friends. That uh, the Mexicans can earn so much money from selling renewable energy and fresh water to the Californians, they could use that money to build a wall to keep all the Californians on their side of the border. Yeah, that could happen. Down south in Chile, uh, there was a company formed called Valhalla that had done beautiful engineering on a system to make a 300 megawatt pumped hydro machine from salt water also. And uh, they had some fresh water that they had planned, but it could easily expand it to include more. And that, that project stalled. Uh, traditional corporate finance tools didn't have the long-term vision to enable it to happen. So big thinking is going to be needed to make this happen, for example, there. And by big, I mean you know, black into green. Like, OK, it can fund projects such as this to make it happen. So I, I, I predict there'll be a rebirth there. So those are big systems. Now let me just step back for a minute and say, well, what are some of the technologies to enable lower cost renewable energy systems anyway? And uh, I wanna uh, bring in some physics here. Wind turbines will get better the taller they can be because the higher up in the atmosphere you are, you can see from this graphic on the left, the better the wind is, the faster the wind is and the more the wind blows continually. So in the future, the turbines are going to get so big and the towers are going to be so big, uh, what happens is they become really expensive because you can't make them. And, and, and the reasoning is the physics. So towers are currently made so they can go under a bridge. So they're limited about four meters in diameter. So to get them strong enough, you have to make the wall thickness of the steel really big. So you get a thick walled, small diameter tower and cost goes with weight weight goes with mass, which is a proportional to the diameter of the tower times the thickness. But the strength of the tower and resistance to breaking goes with the diameter of the tower squared times the thickness. And the stiffness is what you actually design these towers for so they don't vibrate, it goes with the cube of the diameter times the thickness. So me and a, a friend, another alum recognized this some years ago and another alum, uh, uh, Raj, she, she's really phenomenal about design and helping to run this whole thing. We started a company called Keystone Tower Systems. Um, and uh, everybody said, you can't do this, but we invented a machine to in situ make giant turbine towers. Now, what does this mean for implications? So for example, the state of Maine here in the Northeast where I live, vast forests owned by paper companies, not so much paper is being used, many communities are devastated, wondering what they're going to do next. Paper companies used to come in and, you know, people were employed to like mow down a big chunk of the forest, turn in a paper, and the forest grows back. So it's kind of a, a net zero carbon, netish zero. Anyway, uh, Maine doesn't work so well for wind, because of all those trees. Now you're not gonna go mow down the trees and keep them mowed just to put in wind. That would be really silly, form of ballistic podiatry. 
But if you could get the towers tall enough to be way above the trees, Maine goes from having six gigawatt potential to 60 gigawatts of wind energy potential, plus whatever is put offshore. So you do that by going from 80 meter wind turbines to 120 to 140 meter. But you can't afford to make the 120 to 140 meter. Ha, with this new process, you can. And what we do is we discovered a way to spiral weld a tapered tube. Uh, you can go look up the company. There's the website or track the patents that we have issued. And we had good funding from the Department of Energy and then angel funders and then now more traditional. It was a class of startup growth. Uh, built the first machine, more machines being built. And the net thing is, is that we will reduce the amount of steel required to make a giant tower by 30% that overall will reduce the cost of wind energy thus by about 10%. Because it turns out about a third of the cost of a giant wind turbine is the cost of the pole because there's so much steel in it. So problem, what's the problem? The physics of the problem, where's the cost, can help drive innovation, new company, forward. It's not always that easy. Actually, this was not easy. But in summary, that's the process we can do for, in order to build these big giant machines, we can use existing current technology good enough. But in the context of building IFROS machines, for example, we will identify, oh, that's kind of hard, or oh, that's kind of not efficient. I bet there's a better way. And that will drive innovation such as we did with Keystone. So uh, we, we can do it. Here's another example, a uh, company sun folding. So it turns out that solar panels, when you have huge arrays of them, you really only need to tilt them in one direction. You don't need to tilt them in two directions. You get about 90% of the benefit of tracking the sun just by tilting in one direction. Now, you got to drive costs down, not just cost to buy, but also reliability. and these tracker systems traditionally use electric servo motors, which are expensive. So this company's sun folding uh, started in 2012 by uh, Dr. Saul Griffith, really, really bright guy, who has a really fun book, fun, huh, scary, but really well written. It's uh, uh, called An Emergency Break Glass about we are in a climate emergency. You've got to break the glass. You, you, you've got to open up and do, do lots of stuff. So that's a really good book. You can find it on, uh, on the web. It goes through a lot of these details and broader scope things. But here is an example where Saul also saw a problem with cost to buy and operate uh, the trackers. And so you can see there are those uh, black pillows. Those are air bladders. So he tilts all the panels at once by just having a central air pump that inflates the bladder to boop, tilt it. And it doesn't have to tilt it to a nano radiant accuracy. It just has to tilt it good enough. So they've, they've put in, I think, almost a gigawatt of power so far. They're, they're really putting in a lot of power, a lot more to go in. Now, back to the broad scale, big projects, and this is really big, is Desert Tech. So, uh, the idea first was developed by the Club of Rome several decades ago, and then German Aerospace Center built upon it. Fantastic economic opportunity, and you could really have inherent excellent security for the region. Now, it appears to have died, or the original one, because people worried about costs. You couldn't get the power into Europe. Of course, there was the usual, within Europe is a great place, but sometimes it's hard to get things done. I believe that one of the things was our friends in France didn't want power lines coming across France uh, for power that we brought in over Gibraltar. Uh, why? I don't know. You have to ask them. Maybe they were thinking, uh, you have to ask them, but they didn't want that. You could go through Malta uh, much longer, more expensive, but that is possible. So, you know, there's these issues of how you're going to minimize cost. But then the problem was, oh, you know, if we invest all this power in North Africa, it's not the most politically stable place. It's too risky. So they didn't do it. And, you know, North Africa did have political problems. It fell apart. There weren't jobs for people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And vast quantities of migrants streamed into Europe. Hmm. 
Interesting. If Desert Tech had been fully developed and employed lots of people in factories to build the renewable machines and deploy them and operate them, they'd have jobs, pride in what they did, knowing that they were helping to save the planet. Huh. Seems to me that could have brought some inherent security. And here's where symbiotic thinking comes in, because if you look at the cost uh, per migrant per year, over 10 years, and there's tens of millions of people that come streaming north soon, because right across that whole band in Africa, global warming is just going to savage everything. I hypothesize it'd be cheaper to build out desert tech and employ people where they want to actually live and get the power that way. So we have to think symbiotically, not just what's the cost of the power? Oh, I could burn coal, that's cheaper. What's the cost to operate a planet where people are happy? So Desert Tech grew from an initial start uh, in Abu Dhabi and in, in Egypt, um, some fantastic programs. And, and, and it's starting to resurge, by the way. So I'm very hopeful. Uh, and Egypt now has a big new wind power center of excellence uh, with Ain Shams University and, and MIT is helping out. It's uh, funded by USAID. So great potential for these giant wind machines uh, and IFROS type storage systems in Egypt, for example. Um, Morocco uh, really started in 2010 building up. Morocco has a vision that we are going to be renewable energy provider. So that's great. Bravo, Morocco. Keep going. And you know, all throughout the uh, Middle East, North Africa, uh, there's potential for over 10 gigawatts of uh, power easily just today. Uh, I'm sorry, there is over 10 gigawatts of installed and there's hundreds more gigawatts can be put in. Now, one of the things we need to think about is moving the power around. And I understand where people object to overhead power lines. And one of the topics that we looked at, I had a master's student uh, investigate and people often bury power lines, but they say it's too expensive. So we looked at uh, if you do it along railroads, which some places are doing, but what would propose that's different is, is that make the train itself able to manufacture and lay down in situ cable, for example. So there needs to be some research uh, there. You can do it obviously with existing technology without having to have a specialized trains. But I believe if we utilize our transportation corridors as means to have underground cables, we can have not worry about unsightly cables. You have better security against, for example, if there's a solar flare and you have overhead cables, that's a bad thing. So I'm really uh, rooting for Desert Tech to grow and people think about funding it, not just from the pure, does it make economic sense as a renewable energy source compared to burning coal, uh, but also as a symbiotically in a holistic manner that, wow, we would employ people, bring stability to the region, go green, all these uh, socioeconomical and social justice and renewable energy drive carbon down, everything uh, that the Brundtland report called for. And in the end, the system costs me less than uh, going to war over things. Semi-related, the idea of indigenized energy. So in other words, people really want to live where they are. They will migrate if they have to. And everybody should be realized that migration is what human history is about, by the way. You know, I, I migrated from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., now up to the Northeast. You know, first I had to follow what my parents wanted to do, and then I came up here for school. And, uh, you know, one event led to the other, and I'm here. So people can look at me who have been here longer than I am and say, go home. But I think I've been able to have been uh, helpful locally. Um, and uh, so people, but people in general want to be where they, they are, where they grew up. So no offense, but boy, I sure would love to live on the beach in LA again, maybe one day. So uh, part of this was motivated by when I was working in the White House in OSTP in 2013 was when the Keystone uh, pipeline issue started to first uh, come to attention. And that was going across uh, uh, Indian lands, uh, in the Dakotas. And I look at this and I was worried about, huh, there is a lot of potential for disruption, uh, oil spills. And part of that was I suggested, well, 
let's use technology and history. There was a time when uh, the tankers were all single hulled and then the Exxon Valdez happened and people, well, people called for double hull tankers and the tanker industry, oil industry, said, oh, you raise costs so much, you can never afford it. You'd have to add a, a tenth of a penny per gallon of gas and that would be deplorable. And then the Exxon Valdez happened and now all tankers are double hulled. Well, at the time in there, I made a proposal for a double hulled pipeline, for example. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we could do it if they want. And then, but just people still don't want this stuff across their land. Say, okay, there's a tax on every jewel of energy, not a tax, sorry, a fee. Every jewel of black energy that flows through the pipeline uh, now to be invested locally in renewables. And uh, that idea, I think, would work really well. It didn't, I wasn't able to get any traction and I had to leave to my next assignment. But I was pleased to see recently that uh, Cody Two Bears has led uh, an effort in that region to install renewable energy solar panels. And the quote from him there is, we are the original environmentalists of this land. It makes sense for us to utilize this technology with our cultural values. Bravo. And I think that uh, is a feeling that truly should be spread around the world and investment for these kind of things could come from the greenhouse emissions fee, for example. This is going to be one of the, the, the nodes where it should start and grow. And in the end, everyone should look at their home and say, I'm indigenous to my home. I want my home to be clean and a clean source of power and share with others. Last topic is trash to treasure. And we're going to start with uh, sargassum. Sargassum seaweed grows naturally in the ocean, and it's a very important part of the ocean ecology. The problem has been there's a type of invasive sargassum seaweed that is growing around in the Caribbean in vast quantities due to warming of the waters. It looks like combined with ag runoff, for example, vast quantities of the Amazon rainforest have been cut down to plant more food for people. Uh, cattle and everything else, and then uh, over fertilizing because you got to ramp it up and runoff seems to all be mixing and forming a perfect soup for growing sargassum in vast quantities. And this is a very pretty picture here. There's no, what's sargassum? Anyway, this is the research vessel that uh, I had a master's student on last year. And the orange thing is a pump. The black hose on a reel uh, is 200 meters of hose. Uh, it's 330 millimeters in diameter when it's inflated. And the yellow thing is a funnel and the blue thing on the yellow thing there uh, is where these are uh, flotation barrels. And inside here is an auger. And the auger gathers the seaweed that's being funneled into it. The pump sucks it through this hose and then <laughs> pumps it down. And the idea is, is to gather the mats of sargassum that are headed for the beaches before they hit the beaches. Um, oops, sorry. Didn't want to go there yet. Um, so you can just look up sargassum seaweed Caribbean beaches and you can see many pictures of just this muck everywhere. And when it gets to the beaches, it dies, it rots, it kills all the ocean life, smothers it, it emits a terrible stink, hydrogen sulfide, as well as when it rots, it also makes methane. So if we gather it up before it does that and we pump it to 200 meters deep, we found then that it'll keep sinking from 200 meters to two kilometers. And at the bottom, uh, you put it down there and it can't come back up. Any, quote, rotting, it may happen over 100 years, methane creation by digestion of bugs down there. Uh, the, when the bugs make methane, those bug farts become methane hydrates. It freezes, mixes with the water. It's part of a natural process. So uh, this is an immediate short term a way to, to get rid of it and sequester carbon. Now it does require and it should be done also the deep ocean science. Uh, you know, someone who maybe a private person who loves the deep ocean uh, and has deep sea submersibles for diving in the deep ocean, you know who you are. And they say, hey, that's interesting. I'm going to bring my submersible and go down there and place markers and, and monitor the stuff that's pumped down over the next several years to make sure that it's not hurting anybody down there. It's actually just one more food source, which is what it is in nature anyway, when the sargassum sinks in the deep ocean due to a big storm. So once again, the, the machines uh, 
you can go to this SOS Carbon, their website and see the machines they're planning. They can be built locally, operated locally, collect the sargassum in these giant sausages, they call them, uh, collect it all up and then taken out and then pumped down. So you can have local ecosystem, particularly operating now, the tourism has been trashed by COVID and no one's, no one's touristing because I don't want to go travel somewhere, maybe you get sick. So the local economies are being devastated. So this is where they can, in the meantime, become carbon harvesters. And then bringing tourism back, this would also address the flight shame issue. If I think the numbers work out something like, okay, if you're gonna go be a tourist for a week in the DR, when things are nice again, uh, you know, and you put in some few tens of dollars as a quote tip, that will enable the harvesting of enough sargassum to totally offset all the carbon that you spewed out traveling down there and then hanging out. So uh, we believe that there can be a symbiotic tourism with environmentalism for carbon sequestration. Again, uh, everybody wins. Related to this uh, trash to treasure is trash is cash. So one issue is there's a lot of biomass every year. Uh, fields are burned. A lot of burning of things to make charcoal. And um, Kevin here, a student, he did his doctoral thesis at MIT, Kevin Kung, on how can you take biomass and turn it into charcoal? Charcoal is good because what you're doing is you're burning off the, the volatiles that are not good for cooking and you're using the heat from those volatiles to now heat up the biomass itself. And the result is just pure carbon, which is a biofuel. Pure carbon is actually uh, like charcoal is good for fertilizer in fields, specialty chemicals, or you can just sequester the carbon itself. So he's done a tremendous job of now his doctoral thesis, turning it into an actual product and company starting from that. As was, for example, how SOS Carbon started as Luke's master's thesis. And he and a friend, Andrea Spasano from the DR have started a company. So there's this, we have good enough technology now to save, the, save us from global warming. Don't stop because universities, for example, are always creating new fantastic technologies when new problems are identified and we'll bring those into the pipeline too. So it's like a smorgasbord of technology to make us all better. Alex, uh, we probably need to uh, finish anytime soon. Yep, yep, almost done. This is like the last slide-ish. So this gets to this idea of symbiotic land use, symbiotic use of resources. You know, no-till farming works with wind power. You know, right-of-ways carry power from our renewables to where they're needed in the cities. Some people say they're ugly. I say, wow, underneath the right-of-ways and along pipelines, you can graze animals. You can plant switchgrass, things to suck carbon. And then everywhere uh, we need to replant forests. A lot of jobs for people in a distributed mode. And again, uh, from our Aboriginal friends, um, the land is my mother. Like a human mother, the land gives us protection, enjoyment, and provides us our needs, economic, social, and religious. I think all of us like to take care of our mothers in a nice way. So with that, I end. Uh, men and nature must work hand in hand. The throwing out of balance of the resources of nature throws out the balance, also the lives of men. Roosevelt said that, FDR. So now I'm done and uh, any questions? So first question uh, here is, you've introduced uh, uh, a number of wonderful tech, uh, technical capabilities. How uh, can, like I say, a government or corporation or individual uh, to participate in these wonderful projects? Uh, to make it happen. Okay, so I, I think one of the, we got to be recognized that anywhere you are in the world, there are people who will say it'll never work, or the trolls, or whatever you want to label them, that will always stand in the way of everything. So one of the first important things is people to really educate people. So when you have an idea, or there's an idea to be brought forth, it needs to be sold from all the way from the fine, minute technical details. Like when I said, okay, wind power, you want it to go big and you show the plot of why it's needed. 
and where the costs are, the diameter cube times the thickness is what drives the efficiency of the structure. So we need to educate and bring this into the school systems as the sci part of science education, part of uh, uh, education regarding history, politics, art, and we really need society from you know kindergarten on up to be studying an idea so the society as a whole, and this can be done, I think, in a, in a short time frame, you know, one, two years kind of thing. Our schools can become dynamic uh, a team, peer reviewers of ideas to help everybody understand what's the best path forward. And when things are some, I don't believe as are winners and losers, when some people are not winning as much, for example, the coal miner <laughs> example, right? Don't just tell them, well, that's tough. You know, you make stuff that's bad, go move to a city and get a job at Walmart. It's okay, we're no longer gonna mine coal. What do you have as resources and skills that we can now utilize where you are, if you would like to, to now have a new opportunity for that's even better. Okay, so that's gonna be a critical thing that, here's the idea that makes sense from science-based, science rules. And by the way, if you, if you don't believe in science, we're gonna delete your Twitter account. So you won't be able to spew forth silliness about science. You either believe in it or you don't. If you don't, get out. Sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. That's true. Um, because remember, nature doesn't give a damn about anything. It just keeps doing it, right? So that's how we're going to do it. Now, more specifically, I call upon local governments and the people of those governments to say, we government buildings are going to be 100% green in some period of time. Okay, my town here uh, just put in a new community center and during, and I was on the, uh, one of the commissions, I said, we need to have solar panels to go green. And so, oh, that'll increase the tax base. People won't want to pay for that. So, well, we, well, let's ask them. Let's make a line item on the budget. So as long as we explain to people what's being collected and how it's being used, and then we vote on it, I think we'll be good. Thank you. Uh, that definitely is true. Uh, second, second question here is, um, if you can comment on uh, developing new technologies while also uh, commercializing uh, the technologies uh, into like a business. Okay, so um, you have, uh, there, there's this thing or idea that, okay, out of every 10 ideas you have, one of them may lead to a patent. Out of every 10 patents that are filed, maybe one of them is issued that actually potentially something good can happen with. Out of every 10 of those, only one will actually turn into a business. Out of every 10 businesses, only one will succeed and go on. So in other words, you can have thousands of ideas, only one of them may ever get to commercialization our goal is, is to do it faster and to be more efficient. And to do be more efficient, I believe that at the very early stages, instead of just being excited about a new idea, we want to build in the economic analysis as well as the, if you will, the, the social analysis, the, the real politic of the idea. So I can figure out, uh, you know, hey, I can burn burn this and make energy, this is great. But the reality is if I burn this, I might release so much junk, it's gonna kill everything. So you're at the very early stage, just, we're not gonna do that. Okay? So that, the example I gave in the slide deck was the Keystone Tower where the cost of the, you, you know, you wanna go taller, but it's too expensive. Where's the cost come from? The cost is proportional to the mass. Why is the mass so heavy? Well, the mass is a function of the diameter cube times the thickness. Well, why is it so heavy? Well, because the diameter is small, so you need a huge thickness so you can go into the bridge. Well, let's not go into the bridge. Let's just make it where there is no bridges, are no bridges. And that led to a whole new machine, which very rapidly then turned into a new technology and a company, and we're building it. So it's the better integration from day one of the reality of cost, I think, that'll help catalyze ideas more likely to be successful. That's right. I really totally agree. Like uh, the economics need to be in mind. That's on day one. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for the excellent talk and the Q and A. Uh, that's very thoughtful uh, and uh, relevant. And hi everyone. Thank you for your attention. 
that if you have any question about the MIT ILP or the webinar series, please contact me by email, grong at mit.edu. This concludes our session today. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you.